All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. This is a great looking crowd, but an impactful crowd. So the impact is more important. Uh, my name is Lester Davis, and I uh, serve as the vice president uh, and chief of staff to our CEO, uh, Brian Pennick, and also have uh, the absolute pleasure of working with the team of folks uh, that are responsible for supporting, uh, helping to support the work uh, that you all do in this room. I uh, want to give a shout out before we start to uh, the folks who were here uh, early this morning, getting everything great. I think this looks f fantastic. Uh, so let's give our, our folks a hand. Thank you. You know, one of the things, events like these, I, I love them. I had a chance to uh, spend some time with folks just mingling and learning a little bit about what it is that you do. And through from conversation to conversation, uh, it was really driven home why the work that the collective folks in this room do matters so much. Uh, my, my good friend Clarence Fluker, uh, who he and I used to work together years ago in, in D.C., he was telling me that he was at uh, an event recently in Baltimore with uh, young students. And the question was asked, how many of you uh, recently have friends who've thought about harming themselves? There were 10 boys in the room, 50% of the hands went up. 50% uh, of the hands went up. And so as we think about uh, the work we're doing, whether it's architectural uh, design for spaces, which I, I had a, a, a pleasure to, to learn about and how we're designing our spaces so that they're conducive to recovery, or uh, we're working uh, with mental and behavioral health, you guys are essential uh, to the recovery that we know is a result of COVID-19 uh, and the remnants of, of what we've just experienced and went through. So Care First, Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, you know, oldest uh, health payer in the region, largest in the region, 3.5 million uh, members that we have the pleasure of serving. We are uh, principally focused on how do we drive impact? How do we uh, get resources to the folks on the ground who are doing the work, uh, the folks that are in this room that make up uh, the bulk of, uh, of, of support for behavioral and mental health? How do, we, how do we get you the services you need so that you can, you can grow and you can, you can build your work and take on more and help more folks? Uh, it's a challenge that we have at Care First. We know that that's our obligation. We know that we have to show up in partnership uh, with, with you folks and, and others that are not in this room. So I just want to thank you on behalf of, of the team that's here. I want to thank you for your work. We are committed to you. We're going to be there for you. This is not uh, Destiny Simone, who uh, leads our community health and social impact, is uh, fond of saying we don't want to do one-offs. We want to make sure that we're in a relationship with you for the long haul. And we're, we're committed to that, absolutely. I want to uh, have our folks, uh, the CHSI team, I see Kim, I see Sandra, I see Destiny. Am I missing anyone? Amelia. I see Amelia. Uh, anyone else? And the, and the folks who aren't here, the, these uh, fantastic individuals have taught me so much in the short time that I've been at Care First about what it means to show up with community. We're, we're very intentional about word choices. We don't do things uh, for folks. We don't do things to, we do with. And uh, that has been a lesson uh, that is driven home every day in actions, words, and deeds. And so I just want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for your work. I want to promise you that we are here with you for the long haul, and we're going to invest, continue to invest in you because we know that the work you do uh, day in and day out is essential, uh, and we couldn't, uh, we, we, we're a better society because of it. So I want to pass over to our, our great uh, panel. I think we've got, you're going to hear a nice fireside chat. Uh, and we're gonna we're gonna be blown away by by this group. So uh, I'm not sure who I'm turning it over to. Destiny, okay. Thank you. Don't I have such a cool and compassionate boss? Oh my God! Thank you, Lester, Nasima, Ryan. You want to join me? Awesome. Really happy to be here. Um, as the pastor of many a church has said on Sunday morning. You could have choose, chosen to be anywhere in the world, but you chose to be here, so we are grateful for that. Um, and in that spirit of gratitude and kind of recentering, let's take that sort of faith tradition uh, one step further. Would you mind looking to your neighbor to the left and looking <laughs> to your neighbor to the right and saying, I am grateful that you are here? Peace. Good. Peace be with you. Peace be with uh, good to see you. Well, I too am grateful that you are here. 
gratitude and starting with that spirit is a hit of dopamine for all of us, right? Especially those of us like my panelists who had to drink decaf coffee. We're so sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so we are thrilled to be hosting today's discussion on the topic of behavioral health. I, I also want to kind of continue in that spirit. Thank you to the difference makers. Lester, you kind of stole my thunder. I wanted my CHSI team to sort of raise their hands. Amelia, Sandra, Kim, thank you so much for the work to curate this behavioral health RFP. I want to thank the other difference makers like Jen, like Becca, like Megan Collins, who made today's beautiful space possible. They did not from a construction lens, right? We thank Whitman Walker for that. But really from the aesthetic, we wanted to curate an intimate dialogue and discussion, and I have the privilege of, talk, of leading today's fireside chat. Um, now, while I'm a huge proponent of gratitude, um, we also know that every person in this room recognizes that gratitude isn't sufficient to transform the structural, the social, the environmental conditions that shape inequalities among youth mental health, right? It isn't enough for us to look at things like racial injustice, like barriers to access to mental health care, like rural issues with transportation to getting to health care. Gratitude isn't enough, and I think that's kind of what today is about, is learning more about from our 19 grantees that we'll hear uh, from the panel later and from our experts that are uh, um, on today's fireside chat about some of the ways that we can unlock potential, some of the ways that we're thinking about transforming the delivery of care. As Lester mentioned, as the leading health insurer, we want to ensure that folks can access timely, critical care within the four walls of their doctor's office when needed. But we also know that most of what contributes to your health happens outside of your doctor's office in places where people live, work, play, pray, and seek care. And those social determinants are the ones that that are so impactful, so upstream, and really, are, I think, are at the forefront of the innovation that Whitman Walker has been leading. So um, serious, intractable issues require brilliant thinking from two great minds. Nasima, our CEO of Whitman Walker, works to implement the strategic vision, goals, and initiatives of the board of directors. She received her bachelor's degree from the University of Maryland at College Park. Dr. Moran, CEO of Whitman Walker Health System, works to position Whitman Walker as the nation's leader in LGBTQ inclusive care, advocacy, research, and education. Ryan holds a DRPH from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Uh, credentials aside, these are just some of the genuinely most nice people that you will ever meet. So if you don't know them, make sure we do a warm, um, a warm handshake uh, and bring them a shot of espresso, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Nasima, I'd love to start with you. Um, Whitman Walker Health is known as a first responder to the AIDS epidemic, as well as a leader in HIV AIDS education and more. But you're much more than that, right? This year you're going to continue to expand your health services um, at the Max Robinson Center, expanding into Southeast DC at the St. Elizabeth's campus. So I think about a healthcare organization that started as a small DC clinic in 1973 to now serving thousands each year. Let's stay there for a moment, right? I think about scale, I think about impact. What do you want our audience to know about what it takes to accomplish that level of impact at scale? Thank you for that question. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, you're in the old lobby of the Elizabeth Taylor Medical Center, which was a place that people sought care uh, starting in the mid-90s for HIV, and we're really honored to have you in this space. Um, so much to talk about when we think about scale and impact. You know, I think a couple of really key things is to know what you can't do well. And the reason that I flag that is there are so many fantastic partners in this room without whom we actually wouldn't be able to extend the care and services that we offer. Uh, much of what we do is in the four walls of a clinical setting. And so we need other partners to help us with other social determinants of health and things like that that bring people into our doors. Um, other really important things on scale and impact, I think, is being really clear about mission. Um, our mission of service to the community is really expansive. Of course, we're known for our HIV-related care and LGBTQ services, but we provide care to over 20,000 uh, unique individuals every year. We provide a lot of primary care, a lot of behavioral health care services, a lot of dental care. Um, and we do it through a really incredible team of over 300 staff. And there where the impact is, 
Um, without our staff who are well-trained, understand what it means to be culturally humble, to know what they don't know, and to provide a welcoming and affirming environment, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So it's our most important investment. We're really, really honored to have such great team members. Yeah, thank you, Nasima. I want to pick up on something you said about the mission, mm -hmm. because Care First also believes that you have to lead both from your head and from your heart. And I know, Ryan, that's a truly important thing for you as well, this sort of personal, mission-driven approach to solving these intractable problems. In fact, when you were first starting your role as CEO, you were interviewed about how deeply personal this work is to you, saying, I got into the healthcare space because I saw from personal experience what my family went through, the struggles with inability to access healthcare. So that's what really accelerated my interest in healthcare policy, the industry at large, and has been the driver of my own life experiences. Wow, stay there for a minute. Tell us about what drives <laughs> your personal mission and what makes you so passionate about this work. Only a minute. Oh. <laughs> Jen, are we going to get in trouble? Give me um, a... <laughs> uh, well, good morning. And on behalf of Nasima and I, again, I extend uh, our gratitude and our thanks and welcome to the space. You indeed, we are sitting, standing um, on hollowed ground. I, I am um, really grateful to be at Whitman Walker. This is an incredibly special year for us as an organization. This is our 50th year of service, we are celebrating being rooted in community for a reason. Uh, rooted in community for what we have been known about and what the next 50 years for our organization holds. I think, uh, Destiny, I don't know if I have much more to say, but I answered a question yesterday about how did you get here? And I talked about personal experiences of being a teenager, of losing access to health insurance. And Interestingly enough, since you said go there for a minute, I was on the trek to become a broadcast meteorologist. Uh, and then when, we, when my, my family, we were trying to figure out how we would provide access to care, uh, my, my father for his kids, it was realizing there was a deeper call and a deeper purpose to life. And I've spent every day since trying to figure out how to remove every single barrier that stands in the way for people to access care. We're here for the purpose, and I want to congratulate all of the people who are the awardees today that are receiving, to really think about the infrastructure of support related to the state of behavioral health care. That is um, important to our work here at Whitman Walker, both from a behavioral health perspective, as well as being one of the most innovative organizations for harm reduction. Um, I think in the region and in the country for the people that we serve and the support that they receive. So we could not be more grateful to have all of you here on this important topic and to really think about the transformative investments that we can make when the intersections of philanthropy and public health do come together to eradicate inequity in every corner, in every corner, every zip code of this country and in our region. That's right. Well, Care First, as you know, couldn't agree more. Um, about the power of transformative investments that operate at the intersection of public health and philanthropy. It's why last year we curated a behavioral health RFP to focus on addressing workforce shortages in the behavioral health continuum, along with creating um, new access points um, and those that eliminate disparities for young minorities and related vulnerable populations of color, um, rural populations and more. We're proud of the $8 million in investments that we made to 19 organizations, many of which are here today. Um, I want to stay with one of the points that Ryan just made about breaking barriers, because in fact, that's the title of the three-year, $600,000 investment that Care First provided to you guys, breaking barriers to better mental health first aid and peer-to-peer -peer support in intervention for youth. Um, regarding that grant and related work that you guys are leading, what do you see as some of the most promising signs of progress? So I spoke in my previous remark about the cultural humility of the staff. And I think one of the most promising signs of progress for us in this work that's ahead with this incredible support is going to be work that we do to train all of our frontline staff on mental health first aid. 
we have such a tremendous amount of, and everyone in the room knows this, so I'm telling you what you know, uh, you know, such a tremendous amount of trauma in the community, and I think it's, um, I'm, I'm incredibly terrified by the youth behavioral risk assessments um, survey results that have come out and, and uh, you know, the impact on our communities, and there's so much racialized trauma, gender-based trauma, that we have to address and the more of our employees that understand how they show up at every single moment along the care continuum will have a great impact on people's ability to access care. Uh, I think I'm really excited for it. I think it's really important and, and I'm looking forward to ways to extend that care um, and community for our team. Yeah, and some of the, the and Whitman Walker is grateful for Care First investment into our work and expansion at Southeast, and I think it's important for us to talk about that for a minute. Our organization has worked for a very long time, a decade-long strategic plan to expand our footprint in Southeast. We've been in Southeast operating at the Max Robinson Center for more than 30 years. Uh, we have a small facility there, but uh, we'll move those services to the campus of St. Elizabeth's. We have... Um, uh, a massive project that's underway, opening sometime in the summer or fall. Um, and its ideals is it will allow us to triple the amount of access points that are available for community. Just to give you um, a, a, a sense of that, there are currently four exam rooms at Max Robinson Center. We'll move to 64 exam rooms in terms of availability for the services that we provide. That's something worth the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and it's also important to note, too, that uh, at Women Walker, we really believe in scientific discovery and breakthroughs and what that means for community. You know, our work and the populations that we have served, often we have had to ask our own research questions of our own individuals to really get those scientific breakthroughs. And the expansion in Southeast will also allow us to triple our research capacity and footprint. Our organization is proud to have been part of every single clinical trial for the treatment and prevention of HIV since 1987. Today, our Whitman Walker Institute, which is houses all of our research policy and education, has more than 40 active clinical trials and research studies, um, and will be funded also by NIH to expand the footprint and capability of research, and we could not be more excited about the possibilities. And once and for all, our shared goal of our organization is to end the epidemic and to find a cure. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the workforce. You mentioned humility and these sort of expansion points. We know that there's a shortage of mental health professionals um, and that in D.C. only 40 percent of youth who had experienced a major depressive episode received mental health services. For those on the um, workforce side, the addressing workforce side for our nonprofit organizations, how do you think about attracting and retaining talent in behavioral health? For us, it starts with training. So we're really fortunate to have um, different agreements with academic organizations to work with their MSW programs to offer training. And then kind of, this is a place that once you're in, you sort of want to stay. So building that sort of life cycle and continuum from the minute they start as trainees to what it would look like for employment, and then working really hard to be a best-in-class employer to retain folks. Uh, that can be hard. It's been hard through the pandemic. We've seen a lot of burnout and, and fatigue. Um, all of you are shaking your heads furiously. And um, also, I actually think compensation is really challenging. So we have to look at ways that we value our behavioral health providers similarly to the medical providers. Um, and we look to funders and, and grantee, uh, grant makers and others to help us um, bridge that gap until uh, we've totally figured it out. Awesome. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention two of our own most important clinicians, Dr. Oleg and Dr. Gingy Lindsay. Can you guys raise your hand? Go ahead. Hi, Gingy. Hi, Oleg. <laughs> Oleg leads our behavioral health work, and Dr. Gingy leads our public health infrastructure, both of which operate at an important and critical infrastructure for the community health and social impact team as we think about our upstream interventions as well as our downstream interventions for our members. So unfortunately, we only have time for one more question before we move into the real stars of the show with our panel discussion. Um, if our audience hears nothing else today, what do you think is the single most important piece of advice you can give to guide their actions in unlocking optimal mental health for young people? <laughs> I 
I feel unequipped to answer this question when I know who's looking back at me. And I think young people need us to listen. And I think old people think they know everything. <laughs> Ryan, last word? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I'll be brief and just to say that I think we all are wrestling with I'll say post implications of the world that we just navigated, but impacted it for a generation in ways that have yet been seen. And so when we think about action, I think the brief advice is, I love listening because it's with community, and be bold. We don't have any time for anything else. That's right. That's right. Asima. In the words of young people, uh, and more specifically the poet laureate, Amanda Gorman, she has a quote, as we all know, that says, there's always light only if we are brave enough to see it. There's always light only if we are brave enough to be it. So with that quote, I want to close how we started this panel in gratitude. Thank you both for joining me for this fireside chat. Thank you for being brave enough to lead with light in our region. Audience, let's give them another hand. And with that, with that, I will turn it over to our Community Health and Social Impact Director, Kimberly Harris. Thank you. Woo. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I am so, so happy to see friends. I think I screamed just like I just did, like, oh my gosh, how are you? <laughs> Seeing you out in, in person and live in color. Um, I am Kimberly Harris, the Director for Community Health and Social Impact for the National Capital Area for Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield, and so happy to be here. We will be talking um, to other rock stars um, in addition to you all. Um, five of our, four of our grantees out of the 19 that we have will be talking about how we're um, addressing the barriers, increasing access to care, and implementing strategies for recruitment and retention as we we're setting up. How many of you all are familiar with um, box breathing? Oh, you guys are good. So in the spirit of wellness, um, I want you guys to close your eyes or relax your gaze, and we're going to do box breathing. For those who don't know, the Navy SEALs use this technique to uh, manage stress, control their breathing, control their anxiety in uh, stressful situations. And so I know some of you were in traffic this morning. I know some of you were like, where am I parking? <laughs> Where's the coffee? You know, there's a good coffee spot next door. And sometimes we just need to, to breathe. And so what you're gonna do, we're gonna do four rounds of it. We're gonna breathe in for four counts and then breathe out and we'll do that four times. So your first inhale. And then breathe out for four counts. Breathe in for four counts. Breathe out for four counts. Breathe in for four counts. Breathe out for four counts. Breathe in for four counts. Breathe out. Thank you. And you guys can do this anywhere. You don't have to close your eyes. On the stage, I might be doing it. Um, <laughs> And so, but if you need to, you can do it up to 30 minutes or 30 seconds or more, just to regulate, just to slow down, just to breathe. And so I just wanted to share that with you. I'll invite my panelists to the stage to join me. So you guys didn't get a chance to see around the room because we were stuck with the coffee and pastries, but around the room there were conversation starters that really looked at some of the data around what we're experiencing with uh, behavioral health and youth in, in our service area. And there were two things that stuck out, and, the, and that data also is uh, really what we looked at in terms of what we needed to address with these investments that we were making. So we're very intentional about looking at the data specifically around access, but also reducing those barriers. It's one thing to have care, and again, this is a bit of preaching to the choir with the church theme, 
Um, but it's one thing to have access to care, but if there are so many hurdles to get to it, um, are we really doing our due diligence to the, the people that we're serving? And so we wanted to look at how are we reducing the barriers and also increase the access, and then how are we um, really supporting the workforce where we're doing recruitment and retention efforts and also those support things. What are the perks? What are the things that are gonna keep um, someone wanting to, to be in the system uh, working with you um, day in and day out even though the challenges are, are plenty? And so we wanted to be very intentional about this. We have four wonderful grantees that partners. We have four wonderful partners that are representing Arlington Free Clinic, the Maryland um, Office of Public Defenders, Sasha Bruce and Smile. Um, just, this is just a glimpse of what we have. We'll be sharing throughout the year some of our other grantees, partners across the, the region. Um, but wanted to take a minute to really share with you all what we're planning to do and starting off with our wonderful panelists and two things. Destiny and I did not coordinate uniforms this morning, <laughs> <laughs> but I guess great minds. And we have a, a wonderful panel of women in the spirit of Women History Month. And so that was also not intentional, but here we are. Um, but two of the, the data points that stopped me um, was 40% of children in the Mid-Atlantic area experiencing depression. And so when I look at my nieces and my nephews and my cousins of that, those ages, are we listening? Are we taking the time to really hear what they're not saying and look at that behavior around it? Are we being obstinate in our thinking, um, even just about the populations that we're serving because we grew up a certain way or we did a certain thing and what got us here won't get us there. And so that really struck me um, 100%. And then one in four LGB youth um, attempting suicide. That is startling. That is startling. And then it took me back to my childhood, like, what was I doing? And so we're faced with so many things. We talked about COVID, we talked about bullying and social media and all of those things. And this wonderful group of, of folks are going to tell us how they're addressing the variety of factors um, that are influencing mental health and then addressing the disparities in care, um, as well as how are we leveraging resources. The reason why we wanted to have a conversation such as this is to showcase the wonderful work that our partners have been doing, you all in the room, but also leveraging um, the resources that we have. Everyone on the panel has been um, deeply rooted in the community, but also very committed to servicing, serving uh, youth. And so wanting to start with the panel, um, I'll ask you all to introduce yourself, say a little bit about your organization, and we'll jump right in. We can start with you, Pam. Um, my name is Pam Lieber, and I am um, a licensed clinical social worker and the director of our Youth Drop-In Center at Sasha Bruce Youth Work. Um, and Sasha Bruce um, has a number of both community-based and residential programs for young people in DC who are experiencing homelessness and disconnection. Hello, I am uh, Melissa Rothstein. I'm the Chief of External Affairs at the Office of the Public Defender in Maryland and the Co-Executive Director of the Association for the Public Defender in Maryland. Um, and I particularly focus a lot on, um, on the, the criminalization of um, behavioral health issues um, and how that manifests itself um, amongst our clients. Um, and we've actually been partnering with Care First for about four years, um, first on in, um, on a grant to um, to get people, adults who have an opioid use disorder um, into treatment in lieu of incarceration and now on a, a grant focused on justice involved youth with mental health issues in Prince George's County. Good morning, my name is Brittany Dash and I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I'm also the clinical director at SMILE. We're an LGBTQ organization that provides services to the youth in the community who are experiencing um, different needs of one in affirming services. So we provide that mental health support for them, as well as we have a housing program, outreach program, um, that just provides a safe space for our LGBTQ youth to really explore themselves and go on their journey without feeling like they have to be closed off. I'm Marianne Levy. I am the Behavioral Health Program Manager with the Arlington Free Clinic. We are a medical clinic um, that includes behavioral health as well as uh, dental health for Arlington low-income uninsured adults. 
and the behavioral health program has existed there for about 20 years, and we serve adults. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the things I did want to mention, uh, we were very intentional, like I said, about the youth that we were serving. So we ha are reaching out to uh, juvenile um, um, youth that are involved with the juvenile justice system, rural youth, youth of color, low income youth. Um, one of the things that we really wanted to, we, we usually live and breathe in the city, but we know that you know, rural, rural population, youth population are having similar issues and then isolation, et cetera. And so we really, while we have workforce development and access, there is a large range of youth that we're serving and hoping that we can capture all of them in terms of the work that we're doing to increase access to the services and also addressing the workforce and very specifically, and I think Destiny mentioned this earlier, looking at our health professional shortage areas. So we're, we're trying to get double the impact in terms of how are we um, serving the, our partners and how are they able to serve their, their clients and patients, but how are we also helping with reducing the shortage in certain areas, specifically Anacostia is a mental health, uh, HIPSA, and really being intentional about where we show up there. And so we're gonna move on into the programs that you all are um, implementing to address uh, the behavioral health issues that you see in the, in the future programs and the current programs that you'll do. Uh, I'll start with you, Melissa. Could you share and talk to us about the connection between the judicial system and behavioral health and how it's impacted the creation of your program to address behavioral health? Sure. Um, yes, and, and as I alluded in my introduction, I um, really do focus a lot on the, the there's a, a lot of the criminalization of, of behavioral health issues that we see starts, I mean, it starts as young as disciplinary issues that lead to the school to prison pipeline, and then it goes through, um, through adults who might be, um, might have an undiagnosed issue that results in them self-medicating with the wrong choice of drug. Um, and, um, and particularly for people who are who are lower income, particularly in communities of color, where you have disproportionate police presence that will often result in, um, instead of people being being sent sort of to treatment or or, or receiving the services they need, of, of of ending up in the criminal justice system. And um, and our office has has been working, and actually Care First was sort of really um, helped catapult us into being able to do this more of. Um, of, of, of recognizing our role in the public health system in that sense. And that, you know, there is, I think law enforcement is often sort of identified as, as being a responder. And, and sometimes the courts are seen as somebody who can monitor, but it's actually public defenders who have the, um, who have a similar relationship with their clients as a health provider does. We have a duty of loyalty, we have confidentiality, um, and, um, and we have we have the care and concern for our clients, and so um, so we've really been working to be more um, interdisciplinary and have um, we have social workers, peer recovery specialists, um, care coordinators, um, who who are then sort of paired with lawyers to sort of be part of that team to help to help both bring sort of somebody to to help the social workers in particular help sort of diagnose un undiscovered conditions previously, um, but then sort of recognize sort of what are the what are the underlying issues that brought somebody into the criminal justice system and how can we get them somewhere more appropriate than incarceration? And so doing a lot of, um, of them placing people in um, inappropriate programs and our, our new project that specifically focuses on youth and then addresses, you know, we're most trying to keep them with their family and sort of at home, but also recognizing that there's education issues that have to be impacted, there's treatment issues, there's, there might be other sort of family, sort of the familial issues um, of sort of their parents so that they're in a safe home and so really trying to sort of see our role in being able to, um, to help respond to all of that for our clients. And one of the things I think when we introduce ourselves, we leave some things out. Um, what I like about Melissa is that she has, she's an attorney by background. She has done uh, social work as well in terms of the work that she does. So she is very much taking a comprehensive approach um, when you're looking at the issue that you're facing, but then where that issue might land you if you are a homeless youth experience of mental health issues and substance use, um, that's one thing to, to tackle. And then you have this whole other side of it, which is that legal side um, that typically creates that cycle of, of just staying and being stuck in a place and happy that you're able to get youth services so that they can get unstuck um, and, and really comprehensive care from the legal aspect as well. Thank you for sharing. 
um, Brittany will talk, a, a talk to you a little bit about the work that you do. And so SMILE, and specifically the work that you do, really prioritizes um, BIPOC population as well as LGBTQ+, and then um, homeless youth, which there can be some intersectionality with all of those things. Um, what, are, um, what, do you, what do you say or see as trends with those three populations that you serve? Are there um, you know, things that you see that are consistent across or very specifically with homelessness? What exactly do you see with the population that you're serving? Um, so prior to, sorry. <laughs> Prior to COVID, um, one of the things we know, we, we recognize is that there was not a lot of access to mental health services and not even just access, affordable mental health services just for the average person who was looking for any type of support. And COVID came into play and what you recognize is that the need for mental health services grew even more and everybody was looking at how do I manage in this house with my family and my kids and all the above and just really needing that level of support where you really can have an outside help. So then you look at when you're starting to roll into specifics, you know, the LGBT community, um, you know, homelessness and their ability to access the services was just non-existent because you don't have um, insurance, you don't have the ability to um, afford it. And there are not a lot of mental health professionals that have the ability to maintain a certain level of caseloads because the need is so high. So when SMILE kind of saw the need of what it meant for LGBTQ youth to even have that level of support, we recognized the need to open up a mental health, um, uh, the mental health department for our agency and provide that affirming mental health support for, our, for the youth that was actually free so that we're not looking for how you're going to pay for this. We're not looking for how we're going to su um, support this and we're not looking for who has to know because this is a safe space. So you don't have to worry about coming to a program and having to explain yourself and try to have somebody figure out why you why things are the way they, that they are. But you have somebody, you have a program that understands your journey, who can actually guide you into the next steps that you're that you're looking at and who can support you in the best manner to make sure that we're reducing um, the stigma around um, coming out. We're reducing um, the, the amount of youth that want to commit suicide or feel like they're left by themselves and they have no level of support and building that sense of community for them. And as you look at being in the homeless population and the housing program that we provide, just being able to have a safe space to just be you, to dress how you want, to look how you want, to feel how you want, and not feel like that every, everybody is against you. And one of the things about, you know, um, the African-American population is that there's been a large stigma around getting mental health services. In our families, you know, we grew up what, that what happens in the house stays in the house. And so you learn how to internalize a lot of your feelings and your, and your emotions and not really seek out for help. So to find a space where you see somebody that looks like you who can also provide you that service and they tell you that it's okay to express yourself, that it's okay to, to find that level of support, it means a lot because not only are you getting that support, you're getting that specific support for that area that not a lot of affirming um, therapists are able to, not a lot of therapists are able to um, provide because they don't know that population. So at SMILE, that's what we want to provide. We want to be able to provide that, that level of security, that you can come to us and we can provide you with that safe and secure environment that you can express yourself. You can go, to, you can go through five, ten different journeys and we're going to be right there with you <laughs> through the entire time just letting you know that we're here to support you and not just support you, but we can bring your family into play. We can help them understand what that journey looks like. We can help them go through that grief and loss process of what they thought was. And we're actually looking at going into the school communities because maybe you can't come to us, but we're gonna to come to you so that we can also provide you that level of support in that dynamics. Thank you, Brittany. And I'm glad that you said that before we got started, Brittany and I talked about the representation piece and you know, that's beyond race right, and gender. It's the other things when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's not limited to just sex and race. And that was one of the things that, as you can see, she was very passionate about um, being able to connect to the folks that you need uh, for the things that you need to, to, to be affirmed in and also providing services for. And so thank you for sharing that. Um, Marielle, um, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> 
Could you walk us through your program um, and the outcomes you uh, would like to see? I know that you guys are focused on workforce, um, the workforce aspect, really wanting to also know how are you and what is you all's approach to making sure that your uh, workforce is diverse? So um, the clinic, as I said, works with a low income, uninsurable adult in Arlington. And in a practical level, what that means is that the vast majority of our patients, and even more so in behavioral health, are Spanish speaking. Uh, so we provide, at the clinic, not behavioral <laughs> health, comprehensive, we try to be a comprehensive medical home for uh, people in one of the outcomes we like to see is people, our patients being able to access all facets of behavioral, of, I'm sorry, medical health to include assisting them with uh, uh, social determinants of health uh, as well. And we, we um, like the work uh, development. We are implementing a lot of trainings for our staff to broaden their understanding of mental health. Our clients do come many from a background, many, I would say the vast majority from background of trauma, some severe trauma, some more severe trauma. Uh, so, and they're dealing with, of course, all the current stressors of being not only low income, but not understanding the language, not understanding the system, um, not having access to, to multiple systems. Uh, or even if the access is there, not knowing how to access. So we're working on um, helping the staff be more available for our clientele or our patients. I use clients because I'm a, I'm a counselor, but I'm at a clinic, so it's patients. <laughs> um, to, to provide that level of support across a variety of areas and uh, provide um, also emotional support where they are. We, uh, we do have a fairly diverse staff to, to start with, and we're looking um, also, we are volunteer-based, so most of our providers, um, the vast majority of our providers, both in medically and in behavioral health, are volunteers and uh, they come from a variety of backgrounds. So I think one of the things that we try to do overall is honor their background and their expertise um, and their approach to, to care. Thank you. Um, Marielle is also bilingual, so that when you talk about representation and being able to navigate care and speaking to the language, um, also um, work with the volunteers, which is amazing that you have psychiatrists and therapists, et cetera, that are all volunteering their time to provide care. Thank you for sharing that. Pam. <laughs> Hi. What's the connection between housing stability and the behavioral health needs? What challenges do you see that the homeless population is facing most? Uh, thank you. Um, so I think for us at Sasha Bruce, um, what we see, um, because we have such a broad service range, um, we work with young people um, ages 12 through 24. And so for each um, developmental milestone, I think we see different challenges um, amongst our young people. The common thread in all of that um, has to do with our young people experiencing homelessness or disconnection from their families. Um, the reasons for that are multifaceted. I think we've touched on some of them. Um, but I think for us, the barriers with accessing mental health services are equally sort of nuanced and complicated. Um, I think there is the stigma connected to mental health services that so many of our young people carry with them by the time they come to us. Um, I think there is a trauma. Um, there's a trauma that, that led them to the point of homelessness, but then there is also a trauma connected to being homeless um, that I don't think we talk enough about. Um, and then there is just the accessibility issues of mental health services in the city. You know, um, for so many of our young people, navigating that system of accessing a core service agency and um, trying to find a, th a therapist that will see them as opposed to a community support worker, um, which is necessary but also not therapy. Um, and so for us, eliminating those barriers and really bringing services to our young people where they are um, is really what's most important um, and why we're so excited about this program moving forward. Um, you know, we have um, the opportunity to really capture young people where they are. Um, and so for us, that means bringing therapists into our residential programs um, so that we're sort of eliminating the wait time, the travel time, 
um, just all of the different things that might just logistically prevent our young people from accessing the services that they need. Um, but then also really making sure that we have trauma-informed therapists that are um, connecting on a culturally competent level um, so that our young people are excited and want to engage in the services that they need. Um, one of the things that my position also entails is serving as a staff liaison with our Youth Advisory Council at Sasha Bruce. Um, and our, one of the um, topics of interest that our council has chosen to focus on is really just this, um, you know, removing the barriers to mental health services, um, making it more acceptable to access care, um, and making it um, more effective um, in terms of not just going someplace um, because I'm told to, but going someplace because I want to. Um, and we have a really powerful um, young man who sits on our council who talks all the time about the services that he received at our drop-in center because we were able to bring a therapist to him. Um, how important it was to build that relationship with his therapist and how um, easy it became for him to go to see her when he was struggling. Um, and we really looked, took that and used that as a model for this project in terms of how can we build that same relationship with all of our young people that live throughout our residential programs um, so that it just becomes integrated into the fabric of what they do with their everyday um, and not something that sort of, um, I go to see a therapist when I'm in trouble, I go to see a therapist when there's a problem, um, but more just the therapist is available to help me stabilize and thrive. Thank you, thank you. Um, we've talked and, and some of you all have mentioned this already and of course this grant is uh, addressing the barriers to care. What are some of the barriers that you all have faced with either providing care or with recruiting and retaining providers? <laughs> I, mean, I think what I can speak to in terms of the, the retaining providers, um, the, the level of need amongst our population, I think is more severe than folks recognize. Um, and so burnout is real. Um, and, and also when, um, I'm excited about this panel because it talks about care throughout the entire system um, that all of our young people would touch. And I think what has been a problem in the past um, is, you know, sort of there is, there is a lack of, um, uh, uh, is any of this really mattering? You know, sort of because <clears throat> we are still seeing them flounder in the criminal justice system. We are still seeing families unable to reunify. We are still seeing um, you know, sort of um, a use of substances to deal with symptoms um, as opposed to other coping mechanisms. And so I think on some level the training um, and the, um, the need for our providers to be taken care of um, is so important so that they can walk into the services that they provide um, having dealt with sort of their own issues. You know, I think <clears throat> we've all just been through, you know, sort of what the past three years have looked like for everyone. Um, and I oftentimes say that those of us with sort of a monocate level of coping skills have sort of been taxed. Um, and so we are then walking into environments that didn't even have that same level of coping skills. And so what we're asked to confront is far greater than what we've ever been confronted before. And so I think it's important to address all of that on every level um, so that everybody can sort of stabilize and thrive. As a reminder, and, and they say, you know, put on your oxygen mask before you help someone else. And your oxygen mask could look like so many different things as you, we are dealing with some true barriers to care and specifically mental and behavioral health. Anybody else want to share barriers that you might face? Um, I feel like as far as the LGBTQ community, I think one of the biggest barriers is knowledge. You know, a lot of people don't know the access to the services that they can have or the support that's necessary. So you find yourself kind of suffering by yourself because you don't know that there's somebody else there that can kind of help or there's another support system there that can provide you with services. Or especially when you're dealing with our youth that the, the thought process is in order for me to get help, I have to go through my parent. And that's just not the, that's not the reality of the situation. So if I don't know that I can get a service without going to my parent to help me with my struggle, then I'm going to suffer in silence. And I think that's going to be a huge barrier in being able to provide the service to our youth um, and give them the necessary support that they need is because they shy away from 
conversations about what they need because the need because it's a feeling that it has to go through an adult it has to go through somebody and if they find out how am I going to be treated what's going to happen to me what how am I going to be disconnected so being able to provide information to schools and and rec centers and places where our youth are at is very important because they have to have the knowledge that the support is out there in order for them to get it if they don't have the knowledge base then we're not able to provide them or reach as many people as we actually can when there's a when there are a lot of different services who can provide them with the necessary support they have before we get to crisis level. We're getting a lot of clients in crisis level because by the time they're at that far end, somebody is saying, you know there's this program or you know you can go here, but there's a beginning stage where they were just in the I'm confused stage. I'm just I'm just kind of sad stage versus I feel like killing myself stage. And so getting them at the beginning stages where we're able to provide that support and they know that the support is out there is important because the barrier becomes we're getting them late. And that's a lot harder to manage when you're in crisis. <laughs> you just kind of underscored what Pam said too. People don't know how bad it is, and then also it's compounded. Um, goodness, I'm glad, I'm glad the room and you all are, are working to address these issues, and we can be um, very honest and transparent to bring awareness to this. Um, you, you're, I see you on the edge of your seat. I'm waiting for you. What are you going to yeah, say? I, mean, I, I think particularly, I mean, I, I sort of think of, of two major barriers in terms of, um, of providing access for, for our clients. I mean, one of them is sort of detention or incarceration, which creates crisis. Um, and it's a destabilizing force. I don't think there's anybody who has found, who has found treatment through incarceration. Um, and often it, it, it just sort of exacerbates, exacerbates the problems. Um, I, I also think just the, I mean, the level, how pervasive the poverty issues are. I mean, I think we can sort of think about, you know, oh, you, you can't afford health insurance, you can't afford a doctor. And, and, and there are amazing places that, that sort of provide those services. But if you don't have the funding for the transportation to get there, for the, for the, for the child care services that you need so that you can go, you know, uh, sort of, and, and have those with, you know, the stable housing and the food security that puts you in a space where you can remember your appointments and, you know, and your medication and, and sort of be able to take care of yourself. It, there's only so much that the that the the free re resources can provide, and really being able to kind of recognize that those holistic needs that really arise from it. Yeah, I think that's the other special thing about being in this space with partners is that, and you're talking about addressing those social determinants of health, where you might just have one area that you're addressing, but there are other people in the room that are looking at the other social determinants of health. And so how do we connect the dots in terms of, you might provide the free group therapy, but then we also have someone in the room, a partner that they're addressing food insecurity, or housing insecurity, and, and then making sure that, and that's the one thing I love about my job at Care First is being able to do that. I get a chance to talk and meet you all, and then I can say, hey, Brittany, did you know Ruth? You know, Ruth does, or she knows, um, and that's the exciting part about it because we are breaking those silos, even though we still have them, but being very conscious of that. And, and so, you know, I hope you meet a friend or three before you leave um, that can help address some of those other um, things that you, you are not able to. Um, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, Mary, you have something? In addition to everything else, um, I think what we look at also is language and cultural capacity and work primarily with Spanish speaking, which is probably the easiest secondary language. And even then, there is um, not only in terms of the direct counseling, having therapists that speak the language, understand the culture, which are, or cultures, which is not necessarily the same thing. And we do work with interpreters for uh, counselors who don't speak Spanish. But a lot of patients or clients want to speak and be heard in our own language. 
so uh, and be understood in our own cultures so that um, that becomes a barrier but also in terms of seeking uh, resources outside of just once example that comes up fairly frequently actually is seeking um, Alcoholics Anonymous AA groups in Spanish that are accessible. Um, it's actually fairly difficult. Um, COVID has had the, the, the gift of giving us a lot of Zoom meetings. So people are um, attending groups in other countries through Zoom. Uh, and that has been a fantastic way to address some of that. Um, as practitioners also in, um, with COVID and with our population, is learning to adapt what we've learned in school and traditional methods of therapy to a population that may not be able to use those traditional methods because of the pressures of uh, having few resources and um, needing to deal in a culture that is not always accessible to, uh, to them. Um, so that has been some of the issues we're working with. Thank you, thank you. Um, you made me think of some something, and I don't know, I'm gonna shout out the DC Department of Health. I don't see anybody in here from, from the DC Department of Health, but they did, um, during COVID, took a step back to see how uh, different populations wanted to receive information. And um, I, I always chuckle because um, what we found through survey, and I say we because I used to work there, um, straddle in the fence, I'm very much committed to care first, just, 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 just so we're clear. Um, but uh, uh, black older people wanted information on Facebook, where younger black kids were like, Facebook, you guys are old, you know, um, let's do TikTok, let's do Twitter. Um, the Asian population didn't want you to come into their church. They wanted to receive the information, but they wanted to distribute it the way that they wanted to. Um, but didn't want any clinics on site, please provide the information. And then we had some Ethiopian, Eritrean communities who wanted to receive information in their church or in their grocery store. And so I think when we're looked, and this is what we were talking about COVID um, specifically and getting vaccinated and those kinds of things. But I do think we do need to step back. Sometimes we wanna just share the information the way that we think is the best but that might not always be the case. Now, I might not be on the TikTok. I probably would be on Facebook with, because I'm old now, according to the survey. Um, but how do we you know, reach who we need to reach with the proper information, but taking the time and going back to that listening piece to be able to, to, to have that message and deliver it in the right way? Yeah. And so I said this before, but we are in a room full of all the people who know all the things. Um, our community partners, our policymakers, some of our um, business leaders, and um, all of us trying to move the needle in, in one way or another to address uh, disparities in care. Um, what would you ask for um, in terms of partnership to address behavioral health care and access and outcomes for at-risk youth, specifically around behavioral health that you would not or have not or do not <laughs> receive as a part of your organization? Um, all the things, so I'm going to say all the things. <laughs> <laughs> I think, as I think about, you know, sort of the asks of so many of our youth um, that come through the doors of our drop-in center, um, which is sort of the first point that many young people are beginning to access um, services um, during their experience of homelessness. Um, they often talk about um, the, the stigma connected to being homeless um, and how we as a community can um, remove that lens um, when we see young people who appear to be acting out um, or troubled in any way. Um, because all, I mean, I sort of a, just old school, you know, kind of every behavior is an attempt to get a need met. And so um, just asking, you know, sort of the community at large um, to look at youth from that lens, you know, sort of what, um, what need is this behavior attempting to meet? And how can we then, um, as a community, create these places and spaces to have those needs met? I think 
from a you know kind of a, a provider perspective, those who um, provide residential programs for our young people experiencing homelessness, are we recreating their trauma in some of the ways that we create the systems that are designed to help them? And how can we design those residential programs to actually meet the need um, and look at the trauma um, and look at um, being partners with our young people on their journey and not just um, sort of an additional set of parents um, because you know that that relationship had proved troublesome to begin with, and so how do we how do we eliminate recreating the situation that they just left? Um, and I think as providers, we all have that opportunity to creatively look at the programs that we create um, to really not re-traumatize our youth when they're in our care, um, but really use it as a, a, a stopping point um, to begin to break cycles and make changes. that in general we have to do a better job as providers with providing a wraparound type dynamic. So if I know that my program only lasts this amount of time, who am I connecting with so that as, as this person transitions out, this is going to be the best level of care for this next person to go to. And I think a lot of times we don't fully have that next plan because everybody's at their agency working on their specific goals and the things that they need to do but at some point there's an end to a service and what happens at the end of that service is that we don't have a lot of partnerships that says once you leave here you can go here and and i think when we get to that place where we're working better together as providers to provide that next step service with each other so if your next step is to come to me and my next step is to come to you we're working together and we're like yeah you know I have I already have stuff situated for them so we can just sign your name up and we can put you there. But a lot of times once we get to that ending space, it's like what's next for them? And I think we just have to do a better job with making those connections and working together versus just working at your agency, focusing on what your agency provides. Slow claps, slow claps. Slow claps. <laughs> 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 I, I think I would say for, for when things don't go as we want um, or, um, or when a crisis happens, to think about what are the options that will de-escalate the situation instead of giving you that immediate safety that make, make you feel better. So using 988 instead of 911. Um, thinking about for somebody who, um, who is already justice involved, what it's going to mean if, you, if, you, if your first call is to the parole officer or to, um, or to the police instead of to a support that they might have or another resource. And, and sort of thinking about what is sort of the long-term best treatment effect of something that will certainly also keep you, you know, to, to keep you and your colleagues and everybody around around safe, but, but also will allow for the, for the healthiest long-term solution. Um, I was going to build on building uh, <laughs> partnerships. Uh, we work with a lot of parents, and a lot of the current stressors are dealing with systems, both for themselves but also for their children, the school system, the judicial system, the medical system. Um, and. Parents a lot, a lot of times feel left out, particularly when they don't have either the education or the language and feel that the system's looking down at them. Um, so build, building partnerships, knowing how systems work, not just what's on the website, but what's beyond the, the, the web page and how, how to access those services, how to help people be empowered and uh, be able to speak up for themselves and be heard, how to be heard in the community for, to receive services for themselves and their children. Thank you all for sharing today. Thank you for being bold in the spaces that you're in. Thank you for doing the tough work. Um, I definitely want to thank our partners at Whitman Walker, have been partners for a very long time. And um, when I called to say, hey, we want to do this thing in your space, Abby and Megan were like, OK, what are we doing? Let's figure it out. And so when was able to make it happen. And with that said, we want to um, you know, take our conversations and, and, and move them into action. We don't want to just talk about it. What are we going to do next? I think I said, meet a couple of friends. Please do. Um, please connect with someone that you can uh, continue those services when a service might stop or complement a service that you're not able to provide. 
I think we talked about practicing gratitude. Do your box breathing. Um, <laughs> when you're feeling a bit stressed, nobody can see you do it. That's the great thing, unless you have on a mic. I try not to <laughs> breathe too hard up here. Um, but definitely connect and, and figure out how we can be um, out of the box thinkers as we do the hard things, because we can do the hard things. Thank you guys for coming.